Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you have had a great weekend so far and you've been able to enjoy some of the weather outside. It has been beautiful, at least Friday and a little bit of Saturday. I don't have too many announcements. I want you to know that it's looking like we're going to be in this digital capacity for a little while longer. I don't know how long it is, but just hold on and hang tight. I promise we'll get to see each other face to face uh, at some point. So just a reminder to let us know where you're joining us from this morning. Feel free to chat along uh, in the comment thread. Go ahead and take a picture and post it, letting others know, family and friends, how you are spending your Sunday morning. And because we record this on Saturday, I get to spend a Sunday morning in my pajamas, which is awesome. Um, and I get to chat with you. It's kind of fun. So keep those comments coming in. This picture behind me uh, right here, it's a perfectly nice picture. I feel like being away right now. I want it to change on a daily basis. Again, not that I don't like the picture or not a daily basis. I want it to change on a weekly basis. And it's not because I don't like the picture. It's I want you to share your creativity with us. So. If you or your kids or your grandkids or a friend is an artist or loves to draw and paint, I would love to highlight you or them on Sunday morning as we do our worship. Don't worry, I'll give you mad props to whoever uh, gives us the picture. But if that's something of interest to you, shoot me a message and we'll figure out some of the other details. And finally, I wanted to thank you all for your continued generosity, your continued prayers, your ties, and just the ability that you are caring for one another and continuing to check on or check up with each other. That is a huge blessing. So thank you for that. Well, all right, those are all my announcements. Uh, so get comfy, get cozy, grab that spot on the couch, pick up that cup of coffee, tea or your snack. And as my kids always say, remind them, mom, to like us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram and Twitter, all those good things. So if you're ready, I'm ready. Sound good? All right, here we go. Well, we are on our second week of our Therefore Go series, and I hope you were able to do your homework from last week. I hope you were able to send some cards, share some uplifting messages with somebody else. But last week, we looked at the disciples and the commandment that Jesus gave them and to us. And that commandment was to go into all the world, making new disciples. But we also learned that we don't have to be perfect in order to go. All we need is a willingness to take that next step forward, which is exactly where we begin today. But before we get there, I want to get a little nerdy on you, so um, just bear with me for a minute. So in 1963, a man named Edward Lorenz presented a hypothesis to the New York Academy of Science. His theory stated simply was that a butterfly could flap its wings and set molecules of air in motion, which would move other molecules of air in turn, moving more molecules of air, eventually capable of starting a hurricane on the other side of the planet. So Lawrence and his ideas were literally laughed at at this conference because what he proposed was ridiculous, it was preposterous, but it was fascinating. You see, this soon became known as the butterfly effect, and it became the background of myths, comic books, and even movies because of its intrigue. So 30 years after Lawrence presented his theory, the scientific community was shocked to find out that physics Physics professors from the top colleges and universities were testing the theory and found it to be true, accurate, authentic, and viable. And because of that, it was given the status of a law, now known as the Law of Sensitive Dependence Upon Initial Conditions. I just want you to know, I'm feeling pretty smart after sharing all that information. <laughs> but in all reality, you know, I kind of envision the butterfly effect like someone tossing a rock into a, a very calm lake. I mean, when you do that, what happens? What happens? That rock creates a ripple, that creates another ripple, that creates another ripple. That one little rock can send shockwaves across a lake, which is 
Pretty awesome if you ask me. So if this theory works for a butterfly or even a rock too, imagine what it could do with people. What would happen if we flapped our wings and we tossed a rock into a lake or, or even what if we did it into a bucket of water? What if we could see the impact? What would happen if we made just one move? Just one move that would make an impact for years to come. One move that could drastically change the course of human history. What one move would you make? So I want you to hold on to that. Because our scripture this morning comes from Acts chapter 3. Now I want to catch you up with what the disciples have been doing. So the beginning of the book of Acts, which was written by Luke, which is the same Luke that the Gospel of Luke is attributed to. Did you get all that? So the beginning begins with Jesus and his disciples. He is telling them that soon he will leave and they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 says, Jesus said to them, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently upon the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white robes stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who had been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. So basically these men in white tell the disciples, hey, Stop staring off into space and get to work. Don't just stand around here. Remember, you have been called to go. So, moving the story along, the disciples choose Matthias to replace Judas because, well, Judas was no more. And Luke then describes how all the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, which was something new that God was doing. He was filling the faithful with his spirit. Then almost immediately after that happened, Peter, the same Peter, reminds you, who denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. Peter gets up and addresses the crowd, and he starts preaching a sermon. And not just any sermon. Luke describes this sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. He says, Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 people made the decision to follow Jesus and begin that movement. That have been set forth. Three, zero, zero, zero. Three thousand people. That must have been one impressive sermon. I might need to step up my game a little bit. But at this point, all the believers, they had kind of started to gather together. They were worshiping together, breaking bread together, and praying together. They had everything in common. They gave and sold possessions to, to anyone who was in need. And we read that the Lord added to their number daily, to those who are being saved. What a time to be alive. They are taking this therefore go to the next level. And what I love is that their church communities were happening inside their homes. Does that sound familiar? And let me offer this. Please don't ever assume and ever think that God cannot act and cannot move because we have limited travel and we are worshiping in our homes. Because I believe it's the complete opposite. The movement of Jesus began with limited travel and worshiping in the homes. The movement of Jesus began with the church flapping its wing and tossing its rock into the lake. Imagine what could happen. And if Jesus' movement began with limited travel and worshiping in the homes, imagine what could happen with us. I promise you God can and God will. We just have to be open and ready when he says, all right, now it's time for you to go. Go into all the world. So this brings us to our scripture for this morning, which begins in Acts chapter 3, and we're going to actually jump into Acts chapter 4 to finish it off. So the story involves Peter, John, two of the disciples, and a crippled man. This is Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. So one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer which was about three in the afternoon. Now, a crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, 
where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. So this man, um, he'd been crippled his whole life, and scholars believe he's probably about 40 years old at this point. And being crippled, this man was considered ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. I have a hard time saying that word for some reason. And because he was considered unclean, he couldn't enter the temple beyond the gate called Beautiful. So he basically set up shop asking for alms, getting as close as he could to the temple entrance, which was a smart spot for him to pick because people going into the temple would have their offerings with them. And it was actually considered meritorious to give some of that offering away. So for our purposes, this would be like somebody asking for money right in front of our church doors on a Sunday morning when people are walking in. So each day, this man would wake up and someone would take him to the gate and leave him until it was time to come back home. Every day he sits at the temple, begs for money. Now this temple gate that he was at is called Beautiful. So check this out. The gate spoken here has been contested over the years by many scholars. Some believe the gate referred to as Beautiful may be what's called the Nicanter Gate which led from the court of the Gentiles to the court of the women. This gate is located on the eastern side of the temple, but there's also another gate on the eastern side called the Golden Gate, which most believe is the gate called Beautiful. Now, this theory with this gate is that Jews expect the Messiah to come through the Golden Gate. In fact, Zechariah in chapter 14, verses 4 and 5, clearly states that the Messiah of Israel will return to Jerusalem from the summit of the Mount of Olives and then surely proceed into Jerusalem from the east in the direction of the Golden Gate. So maybe this crippled man is just begging at this gate because he needs to earn a living. Or maybe he is sitting at this gate begging for deeper matters. Maybe he is there awaiting the Messiah, awaiting the one who could heal him. More importantly, awaiting the one who could save him. Well, regardless of the gate he begged at, he was there at the gate, called Beautiful once again, begging for money from those who were entering the temple. This is Acts 3, verses 3 through 5. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So this man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. So here are Peter and John walking up, and they see this man sitting at this gate. They see him begin to beg those walking into the temple. And because they needed to get into the temple, they too had to pass by. Now, they could have either ignored him, acting like he didn't even exist, or they could address him. This is verses 6 through 10. Then Peter said to him, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And then taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly the man's feet and ankles, they became strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. And then he went in to the temple with them, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Did you catch that? Did you catch what was said in verse 6? I'll read it again. Peter said to the man, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. So their next move was to give this man what they had, to do what they could, not lament what they didn't have or what they couldn't do. Rather, Peter and John grabbed hold of the only thing they knew they had to offer this man, which is life in Jesus. Life in Jesus to a man who happened to be at the gate called Beautiful. But some believe is where the Messiah would enter. 
So I'll often look up what the various words mean in kind of the Greek and Hebrew languages, mainly because I'm a nerd. Uh, but other than that, because our English often doesn't have a good translation for the original meanings. And for some reason, reading this passage, I wanted to know what the Greek word that you've used, Luke used was for the word walk. You know, Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. I wanted to know what that word walk really meant. Now, it sounds easy enough, right? I mean, how many different understandings could there be for walk? I mean, I think we all know what that means, right? Well, so did I, or so I thought. You see, in Greek, the word walk is peripateo, which means to walk. Nothing out of the ordinary there, right? But as every good infomercial says, but wait, there's more. Other definitions for peripatio are to make one's way and to make due use of opportunities, which is still nothing terribly out of the ordinary, right? Although I do like the definition to make due use of opportunities. So maybe Peter and John wanted this man to make every use of the life that he'd been given, especially of this new opportunity, this second chance. Well, I kept looking and I'm glad I did. Because another definition for peripateo is to live. Peter said to this man who had been crippled his whole life, who was sitting at the gate called Beautiful, the gate that people believed was also the golden gate where the Messiah would enter, saving them, healing them. Peter said to this man who had been crippled his whole life, to go now and be free from the burdens, to be free from the chains, and to live. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, live and make due use of this opportunity. Which if we pause for a moment, we can recall a rise and walk being said elsewhere in Scripture. In fact, it was something the disciples witnessed. Something that Jesus said to a paralyzed man who entered Jesus' presence when his friends lowered him in the ceiling of a house. In Mark chapter 2 verses 9, Jesus tells this man who cannot walk, he says, which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? What word do you think Mark used for walk? You guessed it. Peripateo. Walk. Make due use of your opportunities. Most importantly, live. Peter and John had seen this before. They knew what to do with someone who was paralyzed or crippled. And they didn't take the easy road and just toss money at him. But they gave him the only thing that mattered, which was life in Jesus. In this moment, these two disciples moved. They flapped their wings. They tossed their rocks into the lake and let the ripples happen. Peter and John were now living into Jesus' commandment to go, teach others the words I have taught you, baptize them, give them new life, and never stop making more disciples. So this story continues, and I want you to keep in mind this new understanding of walk, because this is going to get even better. Now I'm going to skip over what Peter said to the people who all witnessed this, but I encourage you to read it. It's Acts 11, 3, 11, or sorry, Acts 3, 11 through 26. Because Peter kind of throws some serious shade <laughs> to some of the religious leaders, and it's, it's highly entertaining. You see, not everyone was happy that Peter and John healed this crippled man. Among those who noticed what happened were some of the Jerusalem elites, the Sadducees especially. They were the head of the religious leaders of the day. This is Acts 4, verses 1 through 4. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. And the number of men grew to about 5,000. So just, just for the sake of fun, in the last couple days, Jesus increased the movement of Jesus because he went 
He listened to therefore go. He increased the movement by 5,000 people. Talk about flapping your wings and creating a butterfly effect. So the next day, Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin for questioning. Now, the Sanhedrin was the highest court in the land and consisted of 71 members from three groups, rulers, teachers of the law, and the elders. So the whole political religious assembly of Jerusalem met to deal with the case of Peter and John's doing. So they ask Peter and John in verse 7 of chapter 4, they say, by what power or what name did you do this? Now the snark in me would say, didn't you listen to anything they said? I mean, Peter ended his statement to the man in the name of Jesus. I mean, come on guys, you're smarter than this, right? That's what I would have said, but that's not what Peter said. Peter said, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being asked to call to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. You and all the people of Israel know this. Which, I want to pause because I love this statement from Peter because he basically says, you got this all wrong. What happened is way bigger than healing this man. You want to know by what power and what name we did this? Know this. Peter said, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Did you catch that last line? Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind for which we must be saved. Which, to be honest, I've always loved that line. It kind of gives me goosebumps. But even more so when realizing that Peter and John didn't simply want to heal this crippled man. They didn't just want to make his pain go away. Pain of maybe physically and mentally and emotional pain. But they wanted to give him life. They wanted to give him freedom and salvation that happens through the name of Jesus Christ. Peter and John's one move was life-changing for the man sitting at the gate called Beautiful. That one move caused Peter to explain to the people watching what was happening and in whose name it was happening. The result? Oh, only... 2,000 more people were added to those who had decided to follow Jesus. You see, the ripple effect continues with those people, and it continues on and on and on, all because Peter and John made one move. What move, what one move do you need to make today? What one move are you being called to make today? What one move is God laying on your heart and your soul and telling you, Go. You see, if the butterfly has the ability to change the, the weather pattern by simply flapping their wings, imagine what you and I could do if we chose to make just one move. See, the move of Peter and John to follow Jesus' command to go changed the life of a crippled man. And this one move has rippled for 1,990 years and has been changing lives ever since. I don't know about you, but that is one epic move. So recently I have been uh, watching the TV show uh, Supergirl. Now I don't binge watch much of anything, mainly because I'm really home long enough to do so. However, with this whole kind of stay at home order, um, I've had a little bit of added time on my hands in the evening. And you know, we don't have you know functions to go to. I don't have meetings. The kids don't have games or concerts or, you know, whatever. So, Jackson kind of got me hooked on this TV show a few weeks ago, and it's kind of one of those shows that each episode ends with a cliffhanger, and it's very unresolved. And, I mean, it, it really, the show forces me to watch, you know, the next episode, right? So in one of the last episodes of the first season, Supergirl, she needed to save the world. And instead of using force, 
she made one move. To share a message of hope with the world, and to remind them that they are all heroes that can make a difference. She said to everybody on kind of a TV broadcast, she said, now in each and every one of you, there is a light. There's a spirit that cannot be snuffed out. A spirit that won't give up. She said, I need your help again. I need you to hope. Hope that you will remember that you all can be heroes. So when I first heard those words, I knew that they would eventually land in a sermon at some point. In fact, I told uh, Jackson yesterday that I was putting a Supergirl quote in the sermon, and his response was, well, I knew you would at some point. (laughs) He obviously knows me way too well. But imagine if our one move was a move of hope. Imagine if our one move was to remember that we are all heroes and can not only make a difference, but truly change the world. I don't know about you, but I believe that you and I have the capacity to change the world. Imagine if we chose to pick up the phone and call a friend just to check on them and say hi. Imagine if we actually prayed and we told someone, I'll pray for you. Imagine if we chose love over hate. Imagine if we chose grace over condemnation. Imagine if we put our phone down and played with our kids or our grandkids instead of having our devices permanently attached to our hip. I'm guilty of this one. Imagine if we said positive things online rather than spewing negativity. Imagine if we sucked up our pride and asked for help, which we so desperately need. Imagine if we chose to see the hope and new life that came when Jesus danced out of the tomb rather than focusing on the darkness that was in there. Imagine if you chose to put your faith in Jesus, taking that next step forward. Now this is a move that is above all others, because this is a move that can save your life. Imagine if you did your homework from last week, what that could do. You see, you and I can be part of the butterfly effect. We can be part of a movement that is making ripples, that is changing the course of history. Jesus said, therefore, go into all the world, flapping your wings, making those ripples happen. Because when you do, and you do it in my name, lives are changed. A difference is made. People can be free. So if you did your homework from last week, again, I know that you made a difference in somebody's day. I guarantee it. So for this week, you got two more things to add to your homework list. This week, your two ways of going into all the world and to creating those ripple effects is to adopt one of our seniors from the class of 2020. Now, this doesn't have to be just you. It can be your whole family. It can be a group of friends. But I want you to come together and I want you to adopt a senior student. I want you to adopt a student graduating this year, whether in Fairborn, Xenia, Beaver Creek, Troy, Columbus, wherever you're watching us from. I just want you to show them some love and let them know that you are for them. And when you adopt a senior, you are pledging to send a letter, a card, a gift, a gift card, snack, anything to let them know that we're all rooting for them. So the seniors needed, needing adopted are typically... Uh, kind of found in groups on Facebook. Um, for Fairborn, uh, the page is Support Fairborn Seniors. Just put that in the search bar and it'll pop up. And if you aren't Fairborn, I'm certain there are other communities that are doing this as well. So your goal, your first uh, homework task, is to find a senior. Find a senior from the class of 2020 and adopt them and just show them, we know this is tough. We're all here supporting you. So the second move I want you to make is to take some time for yourself. Whatever that looks like. Now, some of you might be thinking, Megan, I've been doing a lot of that lately, and it's been amazing. So great, you are on the right track. But what I know is that often we don't take care of us. And at times like this, 
we can start to struggle and that struggle happens a lot faster than normal. And when we cannot take care of us, our cup starts to get empty and we cannot give what we don't have. We cannot move, we cannot make a move when our cups are empty. So I want you to go for a walk. It's supposed to be uh, nice tomorrow, at least here in Fairborn. Read a book that you have wanted to read. Watch that movie that you've been trying to watch for a long time. If you have a porch, sit on it. No electronics, just you, the fresh air, and the good Lord. Pray, start a Bible reading plan, devote your first 15 minutes of your day to focusing on what God is longing and telling you to do. So whatever it is, whatever you do, and you need to relax, give yourself to miss permission to be still, to rest, and to just be. All right, so you got your homework for this week? Now, if you haven't completed last, week home, last week's homework, you got to catch up to. So what will your next move be? I hope your next move is to get up and to go. So now's the time to get up. Be a hero, flap your wings, and start that ripple effect. You can change things. You can change you, and I promise you, you can change the world. Therefore, go. Amen. And amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this moment. We, we thank you for crazy scientific theories that perhaps force us into thinking about life in you in different ways, in new ways. Give us the courage and the strength to stand up and go. Give us the, the ability to see and to hear and to listen to what it is that you are asking us to do and what one move you want us to make because you know when we make that one move that that ripple effect is started. Somewhere down the line, somebody's life is going to be impacted. Allow us to be faithful. Allow us to get up, arise, and walk. Lord, we thank you for those quiet moments in our day. When it's just you and us. Be with us. Comfort us. Guide us. And allow us to keep moving forward. One move at a time. Lord, I pray for all of those this morning who are struggling. Who are hurting, who are not dealing with what we're going through well at all. Father, I, I pray that you wrap your loving arms around them. You hold them tight. And you whisper in their ear, I love you. I got all of this under control. Lord, help us to continue to be a people in a church that is reaching out, making our moves, and showing our community and our friends and family in the world that we are here for them in whatever way that looks like. Again, we thank you. Keep pushing us forward, one move, one step at a time. It is in your holy an awesome name that all of God's people said. Amen.
Therefore, go in the grace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to live, who calls us to flap our wings and start that ripple effect that could not only change us, but could change lives all over the world. Go in peace. We will see you right here next Sunday at 11 a.m. Have a great weekend.